with the Royal Exchange.com. Um, right now, I'm in the Dayton Funny Bone with Nell. Nice enough to give me an interview here tonight. I appreciate it. How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. After six shows, I'm, I'm fine though. <clears throat> now, in the middle of the show, you said, you like, thank you for everybody for coming because you know the game is on. So, I'm a Cavs fan. Are you a big Warriors fan? I'm a huge Warriors fan. Yeah? Yeah, because I lived that? in the hospital for many, many years. Uh, did I see the squares? It's over. over? It's over. Oh, we won, right? Yeah, about 30, 30 yeah. something points. Okay, so I'm not uh, <laughs> Now, do you still, like you said, you did six shows this weekend, constantly on the road. Do you still get nervous at all? Do you get any of them jitters before you hop on stage? The only thing I get nervous about is, is there anybody out there? For some reason, I'm always wondering, did anybody come? Does anybody want to <laughs> see me? But I don't get nervous to come out. I'll be anxious to come out. Okay. Now, your first time on stage, do you remember your first time on stage? Yes, I do. You said you've been doing it 26 years, you said, you've been doing stand-up? How was that moment for you? <clears throat> it was natural for me because I had been doing theater, and I had already done some film and television. Okay. So for me to do stand-up was, was really nothing. It wasn't like how people start off and they've never done anything, no theater, no television, no anything. And they just, you know, no church choir or anything and just starting to do stand-up. I can't imagine how that is. Right. But I had experience in a lot of different genres before I ever did stand-up, so it was natural for me. It was, it was natural. Now tell me about Soul B and TV. You know, I was reading up on it, but I wasn't. Is that somewhere you started doing? Was it TV or? Soul B Television Network was a black-owned and operated uh, television station in Oakland, California, operated by the late Mr. Chuck Johnson who was, uh, had Soul Beat before there was a BET. Okay. Before there was a black owner and operated BET, which is not black owned and operated now. Uh, there was black owned and operated uh, Soul Beat Television Network. It was on cable. It wasn't on network television, it was on cable, but it was local and this was before DVRs and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. So literally, if you wanted to catch a show live, you would stay and watch it. Okay. And my show was so popular that people would literally not unless you had to go to work, uh -huh. <clears throat> people would literally not leave the house until my show was off. And then everybody would swarm and go to the bank and go to the store, and I would too. Right. And they'd be like, I just saw I just you, saw I just saw you. <laughs> yeah, and it gave me a lot of television experience, and um, uh, from being a VJ, music VJ, um, to uh, doing a talk show, to do, doing a variety show. Um, uh, I knew a lot of comics because they would come to Oakland to do the Bay Area Black Comedy Competition. And they would all come on my television show and we would uh, interview them. That was like part of the part of the thing that they would do. Right. So yeah, Sobe was a great and wonderful experience for me and I credit all my television um, um, training to the Sobe Television Network and Mr. Chuck Jones. Now you mentioned the film, television, all that stuff. What do you consider like your big break for T V movies to get you that exposure? Is there a certain movie to roll? Like I think for film, my big break was Borat mm -hmm. with Sasha Baron Cohen. I think for urban film, my big movie credit mm -hmm. and comedy come up was uh, first it was BET's Comic View, that's television, right? And then it would be being on tour with Cat Williams and doing the movie American Hustle. Okay. Um, in theater, I did a play called Beach Blank of Babylon, which is the long, longest running cabaret musical in the world. You can Google it. And this is in San Francisco, and I did that play for three years. And um, those, I think, were my biggest credits. Television, yeah, television comic book, I think, for sure. Yeah. Now you touched on the theater. I had no idea you had theater training. Theater background? From how, how long? When did you start? Oh, theater was one of the first things I ever did. Okay. At the Oakland Ensemble Theater in Oakland, California. Um, I went from choir to theater mm -hmm. because I wanted to do theater at my high school, but I went to all white high schools and they were in Castro Valley, California, and they would always uh, cast me in the chorus, okay. but never in the lead. So I had friends who were training at the Oakland Ensemble Theater, and I would take a bus from Castro Valley up to back into Oakland and um, got my training there in uh, dance and in um, theater and in costumes and in, um, uh, set design and everything. Yeah. Um, so when you look at how everything is going right now with comedy and everything like that, do you still feel like, because you kind of mentioned it in your show tonight, which was super funny, by the way, uh, but 
kind of touched on it. Do you feel like you have restrictions now when it comes to comedy as far as what you can say or how it will be received as far as, you know, they want to think other things kind of sound like now? I think that I don't have any restrictions because I think I've been in the game long enough that I have the right to say whatever I want to about anything I want to. I restrict myself as much as I don't talk politically or religiously on stage because you have a mixed audience. I have a mixed audience, black, white, medicine, everything like that, Persian, Indonesian, African, everything. And everybody feels a certain way, but I think that when you come into a comedy zone, that you should be able to come into a place where None of that matters. Right. That the you know the Baptists should be able to sit next to the Catholic, they should be able to sit next to the Jew, they should be able to sit next to, you know, whatever. And none of that matters. Then you have to let all that go. <clears throat> so I don't speak religion and I don't speak politics. So I don't want to offend anybody that way because I need all the audience, I need all the money. Right. <laughs> now um, a lot of the information, you know, when I was looking for background for the interview and stuff like that, I was just looking on your social media. Instagram. How has it been for you converting and moving over to all the social media age and getting online with um, you know all the different? It's outlets. very time consuming. Definitely. It's very time consuming to not. I don't choose to have anybody do it for me unless they're right here and I tell them what to say. I don't want anybody because I've seen people that have other people do it for them and they'll go a little bit too far and then. Somebody will call them and say, you know, this is on your page. And yeah, like, I didn't say that. Yeah. So I don't really trust anybody to write for me on my social media. I do that all myself. Okay. Um, it's very time consuming. My man doesn't like it. My daughter doesn't like it. I don't like it because before you know it, you spend three hours on your Facebook. Right. It's a pain in the ass. Um, but I think it's necessary to, you know, I think that what I need to do is do less personal stuff and do more professional stuff. But I'm just an open book type of person. I'd be like, who oh, these cookies go to this place or you know, whatever like that or I'm feeling like this or something like that. But I'm gonna try to do more professional stuff and put as much personal stuff out there. I'm in a relationship, I'm never gonna put my man on social media. If you catch us out this one day, but I learned that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. Right. And um, I take a page from other people and see what they've done to fuck up things and try not to do that. Definitely. I think that it's necessary in this day and age, but it's sad that it's necessary that it has in this day and age. Way. Yeah, because like the fans that I have, I have fans that I've had since before there was a life thing. Right. And they're still riding with me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, we, we was able to develop a fan base for social media just by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, you gotta go see this person. Oh, I just saw this person, it was amazing. No, Robin Harris never had social media. Richard Pryor never had it either. Neither did Cosby, neither did, you know, Andrew Dyke. Never had social media. Right. Whoopi Goldberg, Wanda Sykes, never had social media. And they became phenomenons without that. Yeah. So I just think it's sad that we have to rely on that right now, but that's the way it is. Thank you. I was gonna have had a question already, so you mentioned it when uh, I see you post about it on social media. I think it says soon to be misses or something like yeah. that. Um, do y'all balance each other out as far as like I know you said you have to have a man that's funny. Does he even you out though a little bit? Is he a little? Is My man is really actually not that funny. He's funny to me, but okay. he's, yeah, we even each other out. Okay. He doesn't give a shit about what I do. Right. Not two shits at all. He's proud of me, but he doesn't like. He doesn't do the social media thing except for Facebook for family. He's a jazz musician, he plays trumpet. He's very serious about that. Right. And that's what his whole thing is about: jazz music. Real traditional jazz music, not you know, <laughs> you know, baby face and shit. I'm talking about yeah. jazz, for like Tony's month and stuff like that. He's older than me. He was I was a side bitch back when I was young, and he turned me out and we saw each other again through Facebook. I found him. Um, he, he just doesn't. He just doesn't give a shit about yeah. any of this stuff. Yeah. No, and so we balance each other out in that way. I get upset because sometimes we're like, I'm on TV tonight, you know, like, you should watch it. Right. And he would watch me, but he don't want to watch that show. Like, right. he don't give a shit about Charles and Sunset. <laughs> and I was on there tonight, you know, and he's not going to watch it. I, I can't sit and make him watch it. I saw that, and that's, is that because of your other bodyguard? How you ended up on that Yeah, show? my other, no, no, that's not because of him. Uh -huh. But that's why I know a more immersed in the Persian in the culture. culture. Because my other bodyguard is Persian. And he immersed me into the culture, and then I was able to get into watching Shots of Sunset, and then I started 
um, uh, Instagramming Asa and Reza, right. and they knew who I was. Okay. And then so we were like, well, we should go to lunch, and then we did, and then they were like, you know, we should do this, and we should do that. So that's what we did. My wife got me hooked on this show. Like, Shout out to Sensei. It's a good show. It's entertaining. Now, you mentioned going on tour with Kat and um, doing the American Hustle. I interviewed Red Grant maybe last year sometime, and he was just saying, I mean, he spoke highly of you, of course, but he said, like, you just one of the guys as far as how you fit in and mesh into it. Do you ever feel like you the only woman in there, or do you just, you know, dish it, take it, and it's just all love? Well, I definitely know that you better be one of the fellas because you're not really on the road with a bunch of gentlemen. These are guys, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and only if they respect you highly are they gonna open the door for you, carry your bag, and that other. Other than that, be like, bitch, come out, you know, that, and that's just the way it is. Um, I sometimes wish that I were more treated more, you know, ladylike, but I can't say that in that squad, because in that squad, with like cat and like red and stuff like that, they do treat me that way. Right. But you know, with other people, it's not necessarily that way. Gotcha. And you just kind of got to get in where you fit in. I'm over it, you know, but it takes some very thick skin. Yeah. Very thick skin. Now, I'm going to get you out of here. This is my last question for you. I know you did six shows. Where are you going next, anyway? I go to Florida. Okay. Um, next Saturday. And I forgot the city in Florida, but I go to Florida next Saturday. I'm trying to be at home more this month of June because the BET experience is coming to Los Angeles yes. and it's a really huge thing for Los Angeles. Yeah. And I've had a wonderful time during that. Mm -hmm. uh, BET doesn't really allow, they don't really, for a comic view having been one of the most popular shows on BET, they don't really give us much love. They right. don't let us I present, they don't mm -hmm. allow us to come to the show, they don't invite us to come to the show or anything like that. It's a real big struggle to get some love from BET, and we don't know why. You know, BET doesn't have a comedy award show, or right. every, every other award show. They don't have a comedy award show. They don't have anything who, who, you know, sold the most tickets, who, you know, did the most clubs, who right. flew the most miles, or whatever like that. Nobody pats us on the back, and that's why people need to know this is a very ungratifying business that we're in. You know, you better have some very, very thick skin to be because you don't get a bunch of pats on the back mm -hmm. being a comedian. You damn sure don't get them being a female, female comedian right. as my woman. Right. You know, there's a very, very hard road to sow. But, um, you know, I'm doing this for the greater good and uh, I have things to say. Yeah. And I'm not going to be shut the fuck up. I'm mm -hmm. not going to stop and that's going to be it. I'm going right. to talk until I can't talk can't no talk. more. Yeah. Now, who, I, you mentioned some comedians. This is my last question for you. You mentioned some comedians in your show tonight. Who would you consider your top five comedians or your most influential ones that had the biggest um, impact on you? Um, Joan Rivers, mm -hmm. Roseanne Barr, LaWanda Page, Wanda Sykes, Richard Pryor, Bill Cosby, um, uh, uh, my boy from uh, back in the day, day uh, that used to go to jail all the time um, for talking that trash. Um, oh gosh, I forget his name right now, but they made a movie about him. He died of heroin overdose. Oh, um, um. you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> I do. I can't remember his name now. That's very embarrassing. But and then um, okay. you know I love uh, uh, um, um, my girl with the red hair. I'm Kathy Griffin, mm -hmm. and I love um, the uh, blue collar comedy guys. I love Fluffy Gabriel Iglesias and. Um, you know, I, I love Lavelle, like I said, and uh, I like, um, you know, I like all the get down, uh, like a brown company yeah. get down guys. And so, you know, I have a vast uh, array of comedians. I didn't even mention any of the Indian or Persian mm -hmm. comedians that I uh, love too, but I, I like a lot of people. I like a lot of people. Let's tell the people, I guess, where they can find you, like on social media, okay, on so, their pages, everything. Um, my Facebook, is, personal Facebook, is a mess, but I have a um, um, a uh, uh, fan page on Facebook, which is the official Lunell, L U E N E L L, on Instagram and Twitter. It's at Lunell, at L U E N E L L, and my website is heylunell.com. H U Y L U E N E L L dot com. Hit me up, I'll be right back.
All right, man, there you have it. It's Martin G with nail to and we are out. Thank you.